um, implications of worker classification in on-demand economy. Jack, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor. Um, thanks, Aaron, for being here. It's really exciting to see you all, and actually, it's particularly to see authors in the audience that uh, whose papers give us a whole lot of inspirations. And uh, thanks the conference committee so much for giving us this great opportunity to present our work. Oh, sorry, I should actually screen, share the screen. Yeah, for giving us this work, uh, opportunity to share, uh, talk about our work. And thanks Professor Jolin Wuchenko for uh, taking time and discuss our paper at the end of this talk. So um, my name is Jack and I am a third year PhD student at Rockman School of Management, University of Toronto. Today, I'm going to talk about my work on the implications of worker classification in on-demand economy. This is a joint work with my advisor, Professor Ming Hu at U Toronto and Professor Tian Fu Wan at City University of Hong Kong. So this has really been the policy topic that people frequently talk about over the past two to three years. And one big concern behind it is really about the welfare of those gig workers, such as Uber drivers, DoorDash deliverers, um, their, their welfare. Right? So how do we get started? Well, back in 2019, you probably heard that there is a bill uh, in signed into law in California known as Assembly Bill Number no. 5, or AB5 for short, trying to reclassify those gig workers as employees. But well, we know that the welfare of those gig workers may, might, uh, has been a sort of an issue because you know, Uber drivers, they, they, by and large, they have to afford their own social securities and uh, health insurances. And uh, it sounds fair to us to um, give those people more um, in benefits by reclassifying them as employees. But one thing that makes us feel a little bit odd is that um, you know, gig workers are quite different from each other, right? Some of the workers, they, they have their full-time jobs elsewhere and they do gig jobs only to earn extra pocket money. So uh, for them, maybe the employee benefits is not that critical. Um, for them, maybe the flexibility is more important. So to us, it seems that there is some kind of resource misallocation um, in this kind of set uh, about um, regulations such as AB5. So it is not a priori very clear to us whether um, such regulations can really help those workers who need the help. So, um, and at the same time, we actually heard from people um, uh, in the industry that gig workers, are, uh, gig companies are, were really having a hard time um, can dealing with um, regulations such as AB5. So it might be also interesting to study a broader implications of such regulations. So that's really sort of the high level motivation for this work. Now, let me quickly back up a little bit. So um, we now know on-demand service platforms such as Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash really give people unprecedentedly flexible way of working, right? People now can totally decide by themselves which platform to work on, um, when to start to work, and when to terminate. And because of such flexibility, they're usually treated by those platforms as you might heard this term now once or twice, right? Independent contractors rather than as employees. And that means they'll usually not be provided with any employee benefits. Now there's many reasons, there's much research showing that flexibility is a good thing, but losing employee benefits can be an issue. So um, regulators around the globe over the past, um, uh, very recently have attempted to reclassify those gig workers as employees. And the most famous example, as I said, is this California Assembly Bill number no. five. Now, more interesting, last year, we actually have a middle ground. Um, the UK Supreme Court ruled that actually Uber drivers should be classified as somewhere between contractors and employees known as contractors plus. So basically the workers will still have the flexibility as contractors, but at the same time, the company will pay them some, but not all employee benefits. So we will call employee mode and contractor plus mode that we've seen uh, in the current regulations as in uniform classifications because current regulations basically just apply to all gig workers on those platforms. However, as I said at the beginning, gig workers are quite different from each other. Um, some of the workers, we call them ad hoc workers. They take gig jobs as their supplemental income sources. So for them, the flexibility is arguably, arguably more important than employee benefits. But there are also some long-term workers who take gig jobs as their primary income sources who have already worked and contributed as much as full-time employees. You know, they, they, some of them may work more than 50 hours in a week um, on a single platform. So, um, so for them, we think losing the employee benefits can really put their welfare and stick. 
Actually, research showing that by working long term, gig workers may not be able to even earn the um, minimum wage, especially after you deducting the, um, the, the all those kind of expenses and self-funded social insurances and securities, so on and so forth. So we believe the welfare of long term workers should really be the focus in the policy discussion, and that's why in this paper we'll first look at whether long term workers, those who really need help, you be better off when all gig workers are uniformly reclassified either as employees or as contractors. Plus, if not, what are the potential issues with current regulations? And finally, by considering the difference between these two types of workers, can we come up with something that are potentially more efficient? Okay. So to give you a quick overview of what's going to happen in this paper, well, we, uh, we consider an on-demand service platform and we'll model it using an uh, game theoretic queuing model. So different uh, worker classifications will be, um, will be differentiated mainly in two dimensions. First, how workers are compensated. And second, um, to what extent that workers will have the flexibility to self-schedule. Um, so there, there, are few, um, there are three main results and conclusions from this paper. Well, first of all, um, despite many criticisms, the contractor mode is not in the status quo. It's not always a bad thing. Well, what we find is that long-term workers can sometimes earn high. Okay, and the, uh, the quick intuition for that is um, in a in a in free market, there are both long-term workers and there are workers. Ad hoc workers, they are more contingent, but such contingent behavior can motivate the company sometimes create high wages that eventually will translate into a higher average earning rate for long-term workers. So there is such positive externality. Um, second, there are definitely some issues with uniform classifications. The uh, current regulations may not always help and actually can sometimes backfire and hurt long-term workers. So we will turn the issue in the employee mode undercutting and we will attribute that to company strict control. In the contractor plus mode, we term the issue as overjoining and we um, and this issue is uh, largely because of um, the uh, largely because of the fact that workers they will still have the flexibility. So more and more workers will be attracted to the platform by the high wages, but um, but then they overlook that their participation can actually make the platform uh, over congested. Okay, so finally we propose to um, discriminatory schemes that do consider and try to accommodate the difference between long-term and ad hoc workers. And uh, uh, so one approach is from the classification uh, perspective, um, but the other is from the lens of operations. And I will show uh, both approaches can curb the issues in the about uh, current regulations, and both of them can uh, parallel improve over current regulations of uniform classifications. So this paper definitely uh, relates to uh, recent OM literature on labor welfare and platform operations in on demand economy. So in the first, for the first stream of literature, as I said, the welfare of uh, work, uh, gig workers uh, has been there for a while. And actually, um, even before the current, uh, the full blown measures of worker reclassifica reclassifications, regulators have attempted to enhance workers' welfare via, for example, minimum wage regulation, labor pool size regulation. And then we have many papers um, talking about the implications for that. But um, so far in the OM literature, there's still little research and formally looking at the issue of worker classification. There, there is one strategy paper that does study worker classification, but their model features only a single worker. We instead consider a random inflow of very heterogeneous workers, so we believe our model and our insights might speak to the problem at hand more directly. In the second stream of literature recently, uh, there has been this employees versus contractors debate. Um, many people study companies' op platforms' operations uh, with blended workforces. So. Um, most of the papers in the stream, they take worker classification as a given and ask when it will be optimal for the company to only enroll contractors, only hire employees, or instead doing something hybrid. We instead ask the question how gig workers should be classified, and our focus is on the welfare of those disadvantaged long term workers. Finally, because of our methodology, uh, which I will detail very soon, the paper also relates to the vast literature on queuing gains. Um, so in this, in this stream of literature, uh, who at all 2018, they study a rather, a rather complex queuing system uh, with, uh, with some of the customers who can fully observe the real-time queue lens of the system, but some other, and the other customers can only observe the average queue lens in the system. So we contribute to this stream by building upon uh, who at all uh, by first, uh, studying the service provider's profit maximization problem in this complex queuing system. And second, on top of that, we back out and compare different market, market outcomes across different scenarios. 
All right, so to answer our research questions, let's consider an on-demand service platform. Um, so I will first talk about companies, um, the platform one company's operations and the status quo of contract and load. So basically the company will pay workers on a per piece basis without guaranteeing any employee benefits, but at the same time, it will allow workers to self-join the platform. The platform is modeled using an open queue network. Um, Long-term workers, ad hoc workers, they just as customer to a queue system randomly arrive at the platform. If they choose to join the platform, they will first wait in a virtual queue for the consumer requests, which randomly pop up and will be assigned to workers in the queue in a first come first serve manner, or will be lost if there's no worker available. After being dispatched, the workers will start services immediately and they will, con they will collect this piece of wage upon completion. Now, ad hoc workers, long term workers, they differ a lot in their joining behaviors. Ad hoc workers, as I said before, they have their full time jobs elsewhere and there's no need at all for them to always join the platform. So we assume that upon arrival, they will join um, if and only if the real time payoff of doing a gig is non negative. Equivalently, they will join only when the real time queue length of this virtual queue is not too long. And actually, you can see this threshold is decreasing in ad hoc workers' time value CA. In contrast, long-term workers will take gig jobs at, potentially as their um, primary income sources. And once they make such commitment, it will not be easy for them to just switch to uh, other full-time jobs because of the, uh, at least in a relatively long period of time, because of the frictions in the labor market. So for them, rather than making decisions exposed based on real-time payoffs, they will look at the long-run earning rate on the platform and they will compare this with their outside option in the labor market, which we assume is the social minimum wage. Now note that this WNQ denotes the average one time in a, uh, in a queue uh, for, for a request in the long run, right? You can think of this long, uh, every uh, long-term workers, those who choose to work on the platform that's circulating in the system. And this will be the average wait time for them to afford a request to pop up, okay? Um, so we'll consider a mixed strategy equilibrium among long-term workers. Each long-term worker will join the platform with probably the queue. And you can think of this queue as a fraction of long-term workers who make such commitment, okay? So given a piece of wage W, we, can, we know ad hoc workers will join up to this threshold N. Long-term workers will join with probably the queue. We can then derive this um, uh, transaction volume. That is the number of con consumer requests that can be fulfilled by long-term and ad hoc workers combined in every time unit. And finally, company's problem is to maximize the profit with respect to uh, the piece of wage. Know that to keep the uh, to keep things parsimonious, we will uh, throughout the paper we will keep the service price P that that is paid by the consumers uh, fixed. Uh, however, our our insights and results extend to the case with endogenous service price. Right. So um, so th that is about the baseline. Uh, that is about the status quo of contractor mode. Now, employee mode. So we, to align with current regulations such as AB5, we'll make the following uh, important changes and assumptions to the uh, baseline model. First of all, uh, rather than paying workers on a per piece basis, now for each worker hired as employee, the company will pay them an hourly wage and a lump sum employee benefit for every time unit the worker is on the platform. That is both when workers are waiting in the virtual queue, when they are idle, and when they are fulfilling services, when they are utilized. Second, as employer, now company will strictly control workers joining rate rather than allowing them to freely join. And you can think of this as a company deciding the number of workers to hire and setting fixed work shifts. And finally, uh, we assume that only long-term workers can ever be hired by the company. Uh, all ad hoc workers will quit the market. And this is largely because ad hoc workers, they really need that kind of flexibility on top of their full-time jobs elsewhere to participate in the um, on-demand economy. Finally, contractor plus mode. So remember, this is what's happening now in the UK. Uber has complied with the, the Supreme Court ruling and uh, treated workers now as contractors plus, uh, middle ground between contractors and employees. So specifically, the company still allow workers to self-join as, contra as contractors, but at the same time is paying workers prorated employee benefits, at least for the time they're fulfilling services. So in this regard, the contractor plus mode will operate essentially in the same manner as the contractor mode, but there will be a wage floor for the piece of wage that the company can choose to pay. This is just to make sure that at the end of the day, the workers will receive employee, uh, and prorated employee benefits for the time they're fulfilling the services. All right, so we will focus on the average welfare among long-term workers in the employee mode, contractor plus mode, and compare 
and with the baseline to see the welfare implications of uniform classifications. The average welfare will be measured by the average earning rate between those who choose to work on the platform and earn this uh, earning rate and those who um, choose their offset option and earn the social minimum wage. Uh, and I should note that in paper for completeness, we also consider the service level for the consumers and company's profit. But for the interest of time in this talk, I will skip the details on these two items. Now, before jumping to the results, I would like to talk, uh, mention that one, the main uh, challenge in, in, in the analysis is really about uh, the average welfare among long-term workers in the status quo. Now, to pin down this item, we need to know, first of all, we need to know company's uh, optimal piece of wage, W star, and then the corresponding joint probability among long-term workers. However, company's problem, uh, profit maximization problem in this case is actually intractable because given any piece of wage, um, the corresponding joint probability among long-term workers is determined by the average wait time in the bridge queue, which turns out to be a high order polynomial in the joint probability. So basically there is no closed form for this joint probability. And it is not possible for one for 40 to fully characterize the market outcomes. Now, I'll just quickly back up a, a little bit. What make this? Uh, what, what drive? Uh, what, what is behind this headache? So uh, remember, long term workers they will decide X and U whether to join the platform, right? So upon uh, so X post they will join the platform uh, with some uh, with some probability Q independent of the real time Q length. So to them, the system operates as an unobservable Q. But for allied workers, they join contingently um, on the real-time queue lens. So for them, the system is like something observable. So basically, our queuing model just matches the, uh, the framework developed by Huelo 2018. Um, so, um, so basically, we're dealing with a queuing system uh, where some of the customers can only observe the average queue lens, but there are also some customers who can uh, uh, fully observe the real-time queue lens. So this kind of heterogeneous informational structure is really the driving force behind this heading. Okay, so uh, in, so during the analysis, we we have to um, look into the structural property of the transaction volume and company's profit, and think about what kind of conditions might give rise to certain interesting market outcomes. All right. So one uh, important finding in this paper is that um, despite many criticisms uh, it has received. The contractor mode, the, the status quo is not always a bad thing. Sometimes long-term workers can earn high. Well, uh, specifically, what do we find is that in the equilibrium of uh, this contractor mode, if there's no ad hoc worker at all, if they are only long-term workers, they will always end up with, and their average welfare will always end up being exactly equal to their offset option, meaning there is no surplus at all. But when there are ad hoc workers, which is oftentimes the case in reality, right? Um, we, we show that under certain, under certain conditions, uh, long-term workers' average welfare can actually be strictly higher than the offset option, meaning that actually ad hoc workers' presence exerts some kind of positive externality on their long-term counterparts. The intuition for this result is that unlike long-term long workers, ad hoc workers join the system only when the system is not too congested, right? Only when the, the real-time queue length of this virtual queue is not too long. So, if at some point in time, the system is quite congested, there are many workers already waiting there for consumer requests. And when ad hoc workers time value happens to be moderately high, if the company wish to enroll more ad hoc workers, get more ad hoc workers on board, just in case the demand might surge quickly in the next couple of hours or uh, minutes or hours, of course, the company has to pay a high piece of wage to, to, to incentivize those ad hoc workers, right? So over time, such a high piece of wage will translate into a high average, er, average earning rate and benefit those long-term workers. So with this in mind, now we can look at the issues um, with uniform classifications. So first of all, employee mode. Now as employer, the company will strictly control workers' joining rate and such strict control will scare away all ad hoc workers. So there is no longer such positive externality that can benefit long-term workers. So even though the company is now paying those workers who are hired as employees uh, in complete employee benefits, it is not a priori clear that long-term workers as a whole will be better off. Actually, we show that long-term workers can become worse off than in the status quo, either when the employee benefit is su sufficiently low or when it is sufficiently high. And we term the issue here in the employee mode due to company strict control on their cutting. Okay, one thing I would like to note is that throughout the paper, we'll treat this employee benefit, this package, 
as something exogenous. You can think of this as the average level in the transportation service industry that companies such as Uber and Lyft will try to keep up with, okay? All right, in, in the contractor mode, contractor plus mode, um, actually it's, uh, things become pretty much the opposite. Um, again, long-term workers may not always be better off. Sometimes they can be worse off, but now it is not because there are no, there's no ad hoc workers. Now it is because there are too many ad hoc workers. So remember um, in the contractor plus mode, um, the company is paying workers some, but not all employee benefits, but at the same time still allow workers to self-join. So more and more workers, either long-term or ad hoc will be attracted to the platform uh, by such higher wage, but they ignore that the participation can actually lower the utilization rate of those long-term workers already on the platform. So we show in the paper that under certain conditions, long-term workers average earning rate on the platform can actually asymptotically decrease as more and more ad hoc workers join. So, um, so basically um, here, the thing is that in the in, in status quo, we know the ad hoc workers exerting some kind of positive externality, but when there are too many ad hoc workers, positive just becomes negative because the system becomes too congested, right? So again, long-term workers may not be, always be better off um, and, we term, and we will call the issue here overjoining. Um, so there are definitely more and more details uh, in, in either mode, but for, um, I, I will see if I have more time, I'll be happy to get back to you. Um, uh, to, to these uh, these uh, nuances. All right, so we, we see there are some issues with uniform classifications. Um, the uh, long-term workers, those who really need help may not always be better off. Next, I will talk about two alternatives that do consider and try to accommodate the difference between ad hoc and long-term uh, long ad hoc workers and I'll show how they might serve as promising alternative to the current regulations that we have seen. All right, so first um, we consider a hybrid mode which, in which long-term workers are treated as employees uh, while ad hoc workers are still treated as contractors. So I feel like this is quite natural following the discussion that we have so far, right? Um, I mean, for, long, for ad hoc workers, the flexibility is more important, but for long-term workers, the benefit uh, is critical. So what do we find is that first of all, um, long-term workers, their uh, average welfare in this case will be equal to that in the employee mode. Well, this equivalence first says, uh, says that hybrid mode still has the undercutting issue. Yeah, that's right. But at the same time, uh, it implies that it will curb the overjoining issue in the contractor plus mode. Uh, well, why is that? Well, first, uh, remember in the employee mode, there's no ad hoc worker at all, right? So clearly long-term workers will not be affected by ad hoc workers overjoining behavior. On the other hand, because long-term workers joining rate will be strictly controlled um, by the company, they will not be affected by their own overjoining behavior either. More importantly, if we also consider the service level or the, the welfare implications for other stakeholders, the service level for consumers, companies' profit, you can see that this hybrid mode, well, first of all, will always to improve over the employee mode. And second, under some conditions can even improve over the status quo of contractor mode. And the intuition for this positive result is that um, because uh, now workers are um, treated differently. Essentially, the company can use different wages to motivate these two types of workers, right? So in general, the company is able to serve as many consumers as before by enrolling as many workers as before, but at a lower total labor cost. And uh, as a, a quick note, uh, finally, um, even though we, we do not explicitly consider the welfare implications for ad hoc workers, but here uh, you can see that because ad hoc workers treated as contractors, they still have that kind of flexibility. Again, they can participate. And obviously the welfare for this group of workers will also increase. And this just further um, enhance this um, parallel improvement argument, okay? All right, so that is a classification approach. And I have been talking about worker classifications. Um, I mean, to, to formally classify workers, people oftentimes have to go through a tedious legal process, right? That is costly. So we're thinking about whether we can come up with something operational that is less costly, but at the same time um, can, uh, can be more efficient. So yeah, we propose this discriminatory dispatch policy. So we will go back to the contractor mode and uh, we will, uh, but we will let the company prioritize long-term workers, those who depend on gig jobs for living over ad hoc workers who do gig jobs now and then just to earn extra pocket money. So we found that this operational approach can simultaneously counteract the undercutting and overjoining issue with uh, uniform classifications. Well, on the one hand, because workers, they still have the flexibility, ad hoc workers will be there and there could be positive externality that long-term workers can benefit from so, and they will not be undercut by, by the company. That's obvious. But uh, on the other hand, because long-term workers are prioritized over ad hoc workers, they clearly will not be hurt by ad hoc overjoining behavior, even though they themselves can still overjoin. 
So we show in the paper that we formalize this result and we show that actually as more ad hoc workers participate, long-term workers average welfare can increase. In other words, this kind of priority approach just enhance the um, positive externality that ad hoc workers have exerts on long-term counterparts. And uh, I, should, uh, I should note that this optional operational approach can also practically improve over the uniform classifications. And the intuition is similar as before, um, because now workers are treated differently, even though it is in an operational sense, uh, still it is possible for the company to enroll as many workers as before, but at a lower total labor cost. All right, so finally we empir empirically calibrate the parameters in our model and apply our insights to the right hailing market in California. But to be specific, it is actually about Uber's market. So we predict market outcomes given by uniform classifications and discriminatory schemes and compare with the benchmark of contractable uh, in 76 California cities. So why 76? Because um, actually evidence showing that there in many small cities, there's, um, uh, uh, there's no sign of active Uber operations, okay? So green here means improvement, red means negative impacts, so if you look at the first column, you can see that, well, employee mode might help improve, uh, enhance long-term workers' welfare in many cities, but it will come at a high cost of other stakeholders in the economy. And actually in wealthy cities such as San Francisco, long -term, uh, it, it can backfire and hurt long-term workers, okay? In the second column, contract plus mobile barely has any significant impact on market outcomes. And this is largely because if you still remember, and then there will be a wage floor in the contractor plus mode, right? But um, this wage floor can actually be lower than can uh, what workers are already receiving, if effectively receiving in a contractor mode. And finally, if you make pairwise comparison, you can see that the discriminatory schemes uh, that we propose can generally improve over the uniform classifications, meaning that um, long-term workers' welfare can be enhanced, but at the same time, the negative in, in, impacts on other stakeholders um, can be moderated. Actually, in some cases, other stakeholders can even be better off. All right, to wrap up this paper, so we jump into the uh, recent policy discussion on worker classification in on demand economy. What, what we do in this paper is really uh, highlight the difference between long term and ad hoc workers, and we focus on the welfare of long term workers. So, one thing we show is that um, contractor mode is not always a bad thing. The flexibility as a contractor, as contractors, well, of course, give many people a new way to earn extra pocket money and supplemental incomes, but it can also be a good option at least in some cases for those long-term workers and to take gig jobs as primary income sources, okay? And we show that to uniformly reclassify all gig workers may not always help those long, uh, uh, to uniformly reclassify all gig workers may not always help those who really need help. Actually, sometimes they can backfire and there will be in, uh, issues such as uniform uh, undercutting in the employee mode and on or joining in the contractor plus mode. And we propose two discriminatory schemes, discriminatory schemes, one from classification perspective and the other from operational uh, perspective. And both of them can parallel improve over what we have uh, so far. All right, so finally we calibrate and we use numerical analyses uh, with empir empirically calibrated parameters to corroborate our in theoretical investigations. And uh, as a closing remark, we like to say, well, this kind of online market, labor market really expanded, quickly expanded over the past decade. It might be more, become more prevalent in the future. So we, um, we, we think work, uh, the uh, gig workers are quite different. And ho hopefully throughout this paper, we, can, we, we show people that a worker heterogeneity really matters and on how um, worker regulators should exercise some kind of um, caution uh, in terms uh, on this issue, and they should think a bit more about how to properly classify those workers and help those who really need the help. So this is pretty much what I want to talk about this um, this uh, work. Thank you so much for your attention, and happy to take any questions, comments. And the paper is available on SSRN. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jake. Um, are there any quick questions um, before Julian starts? Don't see any questions. I have one quick question of my own, and um, Julie, yeah. maybe you can set up in the meantime. Um, and if there are additional questions, uh, the rest of the audience can also utilize the chat. Um, Jack, my questions about um, can you stop sharing the screen so that Julie can oh, yeah. actually start yeah. sharing? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so my question is about the uh, B parameter, the uh, lump sum transfer. It's exogenous, yeah. you said, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, what do you think would happen if I were to do the following? So the um, policymaker requires a minimum lump sum um, benefit, 
be, but the uh, platform is allowed to choose the optimal level. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm indigenizing it, but I still take what the policymaker says as a constraint in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, any of the conclusions, would any of the conclusions change? I mean, this automatically takes care of these uh, over or under um, the, 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 yeah. the, the problematic yeah. regimes, right? Yeah. What are your yeah. thoughts yeah. on um, that? You yeah. know, how the results change with such um, indigenization yeah. of B? Yeah, thanks a lot for this uh, for, for this question. Um, so one thing, I, uh, the first thing first, because we are consider uh, a monopolistic platform in our paper. So maybe uh, in, in, in the current paper, the platform may may not, and the company may not have that incentive to optimize over this um, uh, uh, benefit that much. But if we are considering the, uh, the competition between multiple platforms, um, then there will be a totally different stories. Uh, th th there might be some competition with respect to this dimension. And as you said, um, the undercutting issue and the overjoining issue will both be uh, moderated. And I, uh, for the interest of time, I'm just talking about one thing, for example, the undercutting issue, right? Um, for So one thing, if you still remember, we show that long-term workers will be worse off either when the benefit is sufficiently low or when it's sufficiently high. But if there are a competition and push the company to pay a higher piece of benefit to first get uh, an workers on board, well, um, what, what one thing that will happen is that when the, the, the benefit is already pretty high, the company might still uh, choose to pay that kind of um, benefit and try to get many, um, many workers on board. So in that case, um, you can imagine that, um, and that the, the, the in, um, in contrast to the monopolist, monopolistic case, where the company will only in, uh, hire a very small number of workers because of such a high labor cost, um, the in the average welfare among long-term workers can be enhanced. And as you suggested, the uh, the issue can be moderated. The under cutting issue can be moderated. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, yeah. I encourage everyone else to ask questions uh, over chat. I'll turn it over to Julian. Julian, thank you for uh, being a discussant for this paper. I look forward to hearing what, uh, what you have to say. Thanks, Ozan, uh, for inviting me. And thanks, Jack, for your very interesting um, presentation. I read this paper with great interest. Um, uh, the topic of worker classification, whether to classify um, gig workers as contractors versus employees is a very important topic, very hot topic that has been around for several years now. Um, and, you know, like just go going through a Google Scholar of the topic, you know, a lot of it is written really in legal scholars and, you know, a lot of newspapers, a lot of politicians are debating it. Um, so I think, you know, like having operations management lens kind of look at this as um, something that you're, you know, like, um, is, is something that's needed, right? So you're addressing an important topic. Um, and another thing is that this topic has a lot of different dimensions, right? Um, the topic of worker classification. So um, there's the dimension of, um, you know, liability, right? Like whether the firm is liable under, if there's an accident under employee versus contractor, um, wages, um, there's many dimensions here. But um, the topic that you're, or the, basically the model that you presented is really distilling the problem into the key issues that you're looking at um, using a very simple queuing model that allows derivation of, I think, very interesting and new insights. So I really like that about the paper. Um, another thing that I found is that, you know, the feature that your paper recognizes is something that I think is very unique. Um, so the fact that it recognizes that workers are not only self-scheduling, right? They self-join, but also they have inherent motivations for joining, right? So you have your long-term workers versus your ad hoc workers. They have different motivations, right? So on the one case, um, one group of workers, that's their primary job. And then for the other group, it's sort of a secondary job that they do and they like doing it because you know, like let's say Uber allows them to have flexible hours, right? So this is something that is new, a new feature in the model. Um, so just an anecdote, um, 
So I, I took an Uber a few years ago and when talking to the driver, basically, um, I asked him why was, why was he driving Uber? And he said, oh, I'm actually uh, working in the Apple store. And, you know, like they give me a lot of benefits as a retail, um, you know, re retail employee in Apple, like they were giving him health benefits, education benefits, but, you know, Uber just provides him a lot of money, right? The wage is much higher working for Uber. So, you know, that really speaks towards, um, I guess, the topic of this paper. So, um, you know, when I was reading the paper, I was thinking about that anecdote all the time. So um, what I liked about this paper is that um, it reveals a new insight about the value of ad hoc workers, because the presence of ad hoc workers really allows the wages to increase because the ad hoc workers have you know, their primary job, right? And this benefits the long-term workers. So this is a new insight that I think is really cool in this paper. All right, so, um, so some of the key th assumptions about um, this paper is that um, basically it's being modeled as an open queuing network. And this, the benefits of doing this is that it really allows um, you know, the modeling the decision about whether an ad hoc worker should join or not based on the, re the real time information about the queue, the length of the queue of the drivers, right? So this, is, this really captures, you know, like that, <clears throat> that decision of the ad hoc workers, right? Um, however, uh, I think there are some limitations that I think, you know, uh, maybe you can talk about in the paper. Um, or maybe address in maybe another follow-up work. Um, first of all, customer arrival is exogenous, right? Um, it doesn't change regardless of the state, whether um, you know, there's a long queue of drivers or you know, short queue, or there's no drivers whatsoever. So, um, and another uh, limitation is that uh, price and the wage also does not depend on the state, right? The length of the queue of the drivers. And as we all know from our experience with Uber, um, you know, we have dynamic pricing, right? So uh, prices and wages um, uh, change based on the state, right? All right. Um, another key assumption uh, in the employee model, so this is characterizing all of the workers as employees, um, uh, basically is that the firm limits the supply of the long-term long workers by you know uh, selecting lambda, which is how many long-term workers they allow to work. Um, so that's kind of the assumption here. So the firm is able to control the supply. And then the second assumption is that ad hoc workers, because there's a lot of control that the firm takes since you know they're classifying everyone as employees, the ad hoc workers don't like this. So they just sort of leave the market, right? So you only have um, long-term workers. Um, so I think, uh, you know, having this sort of assumption um, simplifies the analysis a lot. Um, and, you know, at first I thought maybe this is going to be a restrictive assumption because you're assuming there's, you know, your ad hoc workers are out of the market, but, you know, looking into it and looking at the references that were provided in the paper, I found that the supply control that is being assumed uh, in this paper that the firm is doing is actually consistent with Uber's and Lyft's responses after the New York uh, taxi and limousine company uh, when they implemented changes in 2020. So um, uh, New York TLC, they basically implemented a minimum wage and also a vehicle cap uh, because in New York, right? So you have a lot of um, Uber drivers and Lyft drivers, and a lot of them are just cruising, you know, so they're maybe utilized for about 60% of the time. And a lot of time they're just cruising and empty and they add to congestion. So um, basically New York uh, TLC, they um, implemented these vehicle caps so that, um, you know, you don't have too many drivers out in the streets, right? So, you know, this, this, kind of supports this um, very restrictive assumption. Um, and looking further into um, how Uber implemented or how Uber reacted to these um, limits that were set by New York PLC. So basically 
Uber, um, uh, Uber, you know, like while in the paper, um, they argued that the the firm can simply just lay off um, lay lay off ad hoc workers who are beyond the cap. Um, in reality, that supply control really has a lot of nuance because you can't really lay off workers. So in fact they are doing this in a lot more nu nuanced way. So for instance, um, uh, they have a cap, but if you are a driver who, you know, um, is very productive in the past, you can go online anytime and, you know, like you can get matched anytime. But if you're not one of these high productive uh, drivers, then you need to reserve a time. And basically here in this left figure here, this shows what it looks like. So you can basically reserve the time that you are guaranteed to be able to access the app, you know, so something like that. And the interesting question here is that while in the paper, um, it's assumed that anyone who is beyond that cap is not working, right? In reality, um, they're actually working on an off peak time, right? Because that's the only time available to them, right? So um, this actually could be better because, you know, those off peak times are going to have drivers. Um, so it can better allocate the supply um, on uh, during peak and off peak. So I think a interesting follow-up question that the paper could possibly answer is, you know, um, with this, you know, this cap, is this actually better for the customers because you're kind of forcing supply for those off-peak times? And also, potentially, it could be better for the long-term workers too because during those off-peak times, the wages would be higher. Whereas in the paper, they assume that if they're beyond the cap, they just earn that minimum wage, right? Okay. So, um, so beyond those future directions that I just mentioned, um, some other uh, potential future directions are, you know, just looking at the other factors that could affect the decision of um, your workers to join or not, right? So um, as I mentioned already, having off peak versus peak hours, right? Uh, and, and kind of looking at the decision of joining uh, off peak versus peak, um, again, dynamic price or wage, um, that's another potential factor that could affect the self-joint decision. And also, as you already mentioned, Jack, the presence of competition. Um, so if you treat everyone as employees, then this would limit um, the ability of a worker to sort of join Uber and Lyft, you know, um, you know, at, you know whenever they want. So um, how would this basically affect if there's competition, right? So yeah, but but to summarize, I really like the paper. I, I think that you really revealed some really cool insights that are new. Um, and beyond these few suggestions, I, I think that you know you really have looked at you know um, a not really well studied topic in uh, the gig economy. So cool. Thanks so much, Julian. Um, and actually, yeah, this last a lot. point, this last point is also a nice segue. Uh, to our multi-homing talk to the next talk um, i'll pause before that for a minute in case there's any brief question for jack we have only one minute um, and julian if you can stop sharing your screen maybe uh, park can share his screen don't think uh, there are any questions and park i see your screen now um, all right, so we'll move on to our uh, second talk. Thank you, Jack and Jolene. Um, I will turn it over to Park, who's going to tell us about managing multi homing workers in the gig economy. Park, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Park. And first, I want to thank the organizers for choosing our work, Scott for being our discussant, and everyone for staying until the end. Um, today, I'm very excited to share with you uh, my work in collaboration with Gad Alon, Maxime Cohen, and Ken Moon. And as we all know, the gig economy has now expanded into so many different industries and sectors, uh, which means that the gig workers now have more options than ever where they can provide their services. And so in this work, we're trying to really understand how gig workers uh, make them have decisions about uh, where to work uh, and about different work options they have in real time. 
So what's so appealing, um, Jack did a great job uh, introducing this already, um, of the gig economy is that you know you can earn additional income, you can get extra side jobs, um, better access to work. Uh, but what's actually more, uh, what keeps these workers in the gig economy is the flexibility. And what I mean by that is the work schedule that they can freely choose from when they want to work, how long they want to work, and when they want to take a break. Um, but not only that, they can also choose which platform or which kind of service uh, they want to provide, right? I can paint a wall in the morning, do some research in the afternoon, and then walk some dogs later. So there's no apparent cost at all for me to switch around and hop across different apps. And you may have seen this with your ride hailing drivers as well, where they may have multiple devices up in the, in the front and they can compare different options uh, in real time. Right? This behavior is called multi-homing as we all heard about it. And it's really getting intense in cities like New York City or Seattle. Uh, New York, for example, like Jolene mentioned, in 2018, the, the city council actually voted to stop issuing new licenses for ride hailing drivers. So that's actually a cap for uh, these drivers. And so what it means for the firm is that now they have to compete for the same um, pool of workers in the city, right? So as a number of the firms are growing, um, but the pool of workers is fixed. Now the question of how these workers actually multi-home is very important. But uh, in the past, it has been pretty tricky and hard to trace and study multi-home behaviors, especially when it's across different platforms. So that's what we try to do here is to close this gap uh, by developing a structural model of how these workers in the gig economy make dynamic decisions about different work options based on when and where they are in real time. And by accounting for these multiple work options, we could hopefully understand how they decide on multi-homing. Uh, so we collaborate with a ride hailing company in New York, uh, and we're using machine learning based um, and simulation assistance estimation methods to uh, uh, recover parameters for uh, the drivers. And then eventually we could run a number of counterfactual analysis to try to understand the impact of different policies by the platforms and also by the policymakers on um, the operational outcome for the firms as well as the workers welfare. Okay, so what is the context I'm looking at? Um, here I'm looking at first a very simple context market where you have uh, gig workers with two work options. They're for the same kind of service, let's say right hailing. So we're gonna have two firms here, company A, which I'm gonna call uh, for my focal company industry partner. And we also have a competing platform, company B here. So let's take a look at what a day in a life of a gig worker is like. Uh, so let's say here that I want to um, work, I can open the app and I can compare between uh, two apps here, A and B. The company A, which is the focal company and our industry partner, they're slightly operating in a different way than uh, other platforms you may be more familiar with. Uh, I'm gonna get into that in a little bit, uh, but they pay the drivers based on the hourly pay, which is guaranteed. And so I will say that uh, for this time, I'm getting paid $25 per hour as long as I'm online with them. For the competing platform B, uh, I see that, well, they usually provide you a heat map of where in the city uh, have higher rates and they usually provide you an average rate as well. And so here's 25% extra. Uh, so I say, I was just gonna go with company A for now. So once I pick one company, then I usually get assigned a trip, right? And I can keep uh, going until I have no new assignments. Then I can actually come back to check my options again. Um, here the rates didn't change at all. So I'll stay with A. Um, keep going. And you know, at times companies might actually assign you a new trip before you finish the current one. And so in our counterfactual analysis later, that's gonna be one of the policy we're looking at as well. And so because I have my next trip lined up, I will not be checking my options, but then the next time I'm idle again, then I can compare my options. And so here, the rate on the focal firm A drops to $15 per hour, while the search price on B is up to 75%. So I would say, oh, let me switch to B instead. So to try to understand all these decisions, all these sequential decision-making by these drivers, we uh, leverage two large data sets here. One is the proprietary data from the industry partner or company A. We got data for three months from July to September, 2017 in New York City. Here, we observe uh, about 140,000 work sessions for each driver. And work session here means that uh, the drivers work continuously without taking a break. So when they take a break, then that counts as a new session. And so across about close to 4,000 drivers, 
we observe for every session the time and the location of the first pickup and the last drop off. So essentially, we know when and where they started and when and where they stopped until they take a break. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the company pays driver by guaranteed hourly wage. Um, this rate is dynamic, uh, but announced ahead of time for the drivers is specific for the day, for the time, uh, or like a shift, and also for the driver as well. And they have the way to make sure that you're still with them. Um, so we do have data about the financial incentive provided by the focal company. Now, how do we uh, figure out the options outside of this focal company besides asking all these other firms? Well, we could do that, but we didn't. Um, but we actually leveraged a really great public data set uh, published by New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission, or TLC. Here, they record all the ride hailing trips as well as taxi cab uh, trips in New York as well. So we can look at the trips done by this particular competing platform. Uh, unfortunately, we do not observe the driver ID, uh, but we do see the time and the location for every pickup and every drop off. So in a way, we can actually observe the level of activity uh, for this other platform and also for our focal for platform as well. Now, when you, when you think about this data, right, it essentially gives us the idea about the influx and outflux of drivers in each neighborhood in New York. So we could essentially approximate the potential shortages or excess of drivers in each location, which could indicate potential surge pricing on this other platform. Right, so together with the price breakdowns posted by uh, the company platform website, we can try to actually approximate the amount or uh, the rate of search pricing at each location and each time in New York City at the same time uh, of our focal data set. And so here's an example of what it looks like. Um, on the left hand side here, I have the uh, probability that uh, the competing platform would have a shortage of drivers by each location and each hour. And so the darker the color here means more likely to have shortage of drivers, which may indicate higher rate of search pricing. On the right hand side, I have the probability of the drivers on the focal platform leaving the focal platform at different time and location. And so what I'm trying to do here, um, our identification strategy is try to use the left figure to explain the decisions we observe in the right figure. Okay, so we try to see how time and location play a role in uh, drivers' dynamic decisions here. So how do we do model the drivers? Um, first, we assume that the drivers are homogeneous in terms of how forward-looking they are. So we have one discount factor beta here. Uh, we're going to uh, model the heterogeneity of the drivers by the cost, the perceived cost they uh, incur when they work for a unit time interval or APOC. So this interval, we choose it to be 20 minutes, which is the average trip duration of a ride hailing. And so we assume that the cost to drive uh, CI here will be drawn from a truncated normal distribution with uh, parameters mu and sigma here. So essentially the key parameters we try to estimate would be beta, uh, mu and sigma. And once we obtain this population level distribution, we could then conditional on what we observe in the data recover the individual perceived cost for each driver, okay? Um, and so this is how we model the decision. Again, two firms for the same service. We're looking at a finite time horizon here as we observe from the data and from talking to drivers, they don't really work more than um, 24 hours. And so by midnight, we assume that they go home. So we also assume that the drivers already started working for the fir focal firm A, right? So the question here is more about like, for your current active workers, how would you retain them? How would you estimate how likely they would switch out to the competing platform, right? And so because the drivers are working for the firm A, they can be assigned a task like driving. They can learn some information like market conditions and the demand. And after they finish the ride, they could choose to first stay with the company A, they could switch to the competing platform B, or they can choose to leave and go home. If they choose to switch to company B, they will enter a very similar model, uh, except now we assume that that's only two decisions after each task, either to stay with B still or to quit. And the reason we did not, did not model the decision um, for the driver to switch back to the focal platform is again, is kind of validated from the data that we have that most drivers have uh, one long work session per day um, and also from talking to drivers as well. All right, and so since the drivers could end that day on the competing platform, we'll start modeling that first. So 
because there's only two decisions. Let's start with uh, what is the value of working for company B at any location or any time? Of course, you would incur some cost to work. Now for ride hailing, your location would depend on whether you get a match, right? And so if you get a match with a passenger, then your um, next location and time is uh, chosen by the customer. So you know already the trip to the new location. And so the first part of this value function would just be, what is the expected value to go if you get a match well, with a passenger, which would depend on a number of things like how likely you're gonna get a match, the transition probability to get to different places, average fare and trip duration and so on. If you didn't get a match, here we make an assumption that um, because it's such a short amount of time, you might not want to relocate. So we assume that there's no relocation or repositioning here. And so in the next time interval, the driver was just gonna stay in the same location. And by the way, in, the, uh, in New York, usually the utilization is pretty high as well. And so the last component of the value function here would be what is the expected value to go if you didn't get a match, okay? And so uh, some of these we can approximate it from the public data and the two costs and the beta are what we're trying to estimate here. Uh, for this the competing platform, what we did was we separate each day into a time block of three hours. And within each time block, we can solve the infinite horizon DP until we get the converged value of working for this platform. And so at the end, we're gonna get the perceived, uh, the expected value of working for the competing platform for each driver at each location for each time block in a day. Now when we did this, uh, let's come back to the focal firm. Uh, very similar idea. Now we just have two new things here. One is that no matter uh, you get a ride or not, you're actually going to get paid the guaranteed pay every hour. And also you have the decision to switch to the competing platform. Again, uh, they're going to choose between the three options. Um, and here we allow them to have some errors in their comparison of the values. Um, so here for the decision to quit, we normalize it to be zero. Same for the competing platform as well. Uh, going home is uh, zero. The value of switching is basically what we approximated earlier for the competing platform, right? You, we already know for each person, each location, each time, what is the value of that? And so the last thing we have to estimate is the uh, value of working for the focal platform. And so for this, <clears throat> uh, again, very similar form here, uh, the value to go if you get a match and the value to go if you didn't get a match. And so same idea, yeah, using all of these uh, information that we can get from the public data, from the proprietary data and also from the estimation we have. And for this one, uh, we know that it's finite horizon. And because we already solved for the other values, we can actually do like backward induction to solve for what is the expected value for working for the focal firm for everyone at any time and each location. A lot of things. And that's lead to our estimation, which you can have uh, you can see that because of there's a lot of moving pieces here. Uh, we might have to resort to uh, probably cannot get a close form for our maximum likelihood um, and it would be a little bit too complex. So here we're going to resort to machine learning and simulation assistant estimation methods instead. And so how are we going to uh, estimate these? Well, first, what is the outcome we're looking at? So for every day, we want to look at what fraction of drivers on the focal firm choose to quit at different time and location. Right? So think about a two dimension kind of distribution here. We have ish, which is the hours, so whether they're going to quit from 7 a.m. all the way to midnight. L here's the location. So we break New York down to 20, New York City down to 20 regions. And so from the data, we can actually get some sort of distribution like this or a heat map like this, where um, we have quitting hour on the y-axis, the quitting location on the x-axis. And so each cell here is the fraction of drivers who quit at location L at time H for each day. Right. And so to simulate the deficiency, given any parameters, uh, values, um, I'm going to kind of speed through this. Um, but the idea here is that it's still pretty computational challenging for us. So we did a lot of uh, pre computation. And the idea here is that for great values of beta and cost, for every driver, we can actually um, try to simulate that deficient 100 times. And so for every day, each driver, uh, we can get a distribution of where they quit. And when they quit um, for this particular pair of value, do this for every day, for everyone. Um, and then once we actually have a set of parameter theta, which include beta, mu, and sigma here, remember 
that we're going to draw a cost for everyone from this truncated normal. So let's say I draw the cost for this guy. Um, what I'm going to do is rather than re-simulate the whole decisions again, I'm just going to look at the closest four points, the four pairs of beta and cost that I estimated earlier. And so the decisions here will just be a linear interpolation of the four closest points. So we can do the same thing across everyone. And once we aggregate across all drivers, we could get the similar distribution for each day as well. What fraction of drivers, given the parameter set theta, when and where they're quitting. Um, and so the goal here, the eventual goal here is, can we find the parameter set theta that minimize the distance function between these two distributions? Because we want to be able to uh, generate the simulation that looks as if it's from the real data, right? And so uh, there's uh, several uh, in, uh, really good simulation assisted estimation methods, but again, not, uh, I think it's too complex for us. So we actually resort to even a better way to learn from data, machine learning. And so we uh, use this algorithm, uh, general generative adversarial networks or GANs, which is basically uh, a two person minimax game, right? Where uh, you have the generator to try to create these fake faces or images of faces. Um, and then together with the real faces, images, you can have the second person, which is a discriminator, which is the algorithm to try to distinguish between what is real and what is fake data, right? And so we see some similarities here, right? Here, we try to distinguish real versus fake images. What we want to do is we want to distinguish between real and fake uh, distributions of decisions. And so here we uh, adopt this approach uh, proposed by Kaji et al. in 2020 called adversarial estimation, where in our case, the real faces are the real data that we have. The generated faces are the heat map we got from our simulation. And so we're going to choose our discriminator to be a neural network to classify whether these heat maps are from the real data or from our simulation. And so in the end, given any heat map, we're gonna get what is probability that is real. And so we choose our generator to actually be our structural model. Right. So the idea here is we try to pick um, the structural model, the parameters for the structural model, such that it spits out this simulated distribution that the discriminator has a hard time distinguishing between the two. Once we get to that point, it means that we actually got really good parameters to generate um, the distribution as if it was done by real workers. All right. Um, so let's take a look at the results. Um, we found that the discount factor beta is around uh, 0.95, which means that people are forward looking, but they're still pretty relatively myopic here, uh, which means that um, they would be hopefully likely influenced by kind of real time uh, outside options. Um, and here to translate into uh, US dollars, it means that the drivers will think of the net earnings they can get two hours from now for each dollar, it's as if it's uh, 74 cents. On the population side, we found the uh, distribution for the cost uh, to have the mean of uh, uh, 53 cents and the sigma of uh, 51 cents. And so having this population level distribution, we could then recover uh, each driver's individual perceived cost, right? Using Bayesian updating, given that we already observed all of their deficiencies in the data. And so here's an example of the, uh, how the distribution looks like uh, for, for the cost. Now, once we get the cost from everyone, we could do a simulation again to see what is their final deficiency and kind of do a, a kind of informal comparison with our data to see how well our model fits, right? Which is pretty, uh, which fits pretty well. And so what we could do from that is then we can look at how, uh, how likely they're going to multi-home here. And so first we here, uh, we found that uh, if you look at the fraction of working days where these drivers work for the focal firm, we found that about 67% of them actually multi-home during the majority of the days they work for the focal company. Uh, and we can also look at the extreme here. We found that about 42% of drivers always multi-home whenever they work for the focal firm. And on the other extreme, 16% of them never actually multi-home at all. And so we can also look at the timing of the multi-home decisions. Uh, and what you can see here, these dotted line is when the hourly rates usually change. And so you can see here that uh, people tend to switch when in the first few hours when the rate changes. So it seems like they may like the, uh, the certainty of the guaranteed pay, but once the rate change, it's the time they start comparing uh, with other options again. 
we can also look at utilization. And that's when we also find that uh, the time people switch out from A tend to coincide when they have really low utilization or they have a drop in utilization in the football firm, which may suggest that people uh, dislike um, being idle, even though they're getting paid uh, by hour already. And interestingly, if you look at the late night part of the day um, on an average weekday, uh, that's when utilization will keep declining and you will see people uh, start switching out more and more um, to other platforms. Now, what can we do with this for the natural follow-up question would be, is multi-homing good or bad? And what you can do about it? Um, well, recent uh, theoretical research have shown that it can be good because people's workers spend less time idling but on the other hand, they may actually work more but earn less money, so that's a bad thing. Um, but again, if you go back to the story of uh, New York City or Seattle capping the number of drivers, then from the focal, uh, from the platform's point of view, multi-time is kind of bad because it means that drivers spend less time working for you, right? And so here we're gonna look at different ways that you can control multi-homing from the firm's perspective and also from the city perspective. Um, Here's just a quick overview of our counterfactuals from the firm side. We're looking at how the firm can optimize their pay scheme, the way they compensate their drivers um, in a way to manage the long-term capacity. But again, as you can see in the gig economy, things change in real time. Uh, we're also gonna look at different financial uh, incentive bonuses or frictions or delays that the firm can impose to actually manage the short-term capacity to respond to real-time um, change in demand and supply. From the city or the government point of view, uh, we could uh, look at one thing uh, kind of similar to what was brought up earlier too. In 2018, New York City launched this new policy uh, that is similar to a minimum wage, a minimum wage type policy. Um, so we can look at what is the impact of the minimum wage policy on the driver's earnings and utilizations here when they can multi hold um, for the interest of time, I'm going to focus on the firm side for now, um, but just one insight from the city one is that obviously one policy for all will hurt. Um, it really means that policymakers should look at the way companies pay their drivers, uh, digitalizations, and also the way people think about multi homing when coming up with regulations. So let me zoom into quickly on these firm policies. Long term, well, we can look at the way they pay people. You may be more familiar with the paperwork, right? You only pay the workers based on the work they did. Um, <clears throat> so this is good for the firm because it's pretty transparent, right? You, you only paid uh, for the actual work happening, but there's some downside as well, like uh, the workers who have to keep checking constantly for promotions. Um, and also for the firm, it might be too late for them to get more supply when uh, there's a huge surge in demand. On the other hand, we have a scheme that the Focal company uses and also other platforms like GoPuff and Postmates, which is basically workers get a guaranteed fixed rate of hourly compensation as long as they are active. Um, good thing is, well, it's consistent. It, the company is certain of how much they have to pay. Obviously the downside is that during the low demand period, you might not want to um, pay everyone for just staying idle. And you may also only attract uh, only a segment of drivers who uh, are averse to uh, income uncertainty. And so what we're gonna do here is, what if the focal company switched to pay drivers by the trip, uh, what would happen? And so here, we already know um, the wage they're paying the driver. So we try to find what is the equivalent pay per work rate such that on average, um, the drivers get paid the same amount. And so we're gonna call this as one X to compare. And so what we find here is that to maintain the same amount of work you get from the drivers, <clears throat> you have to actually pay them uh, at about 25 to 50% higher pay per work rate, while you can actually keep paying them the guarantee rate and get the same uh, work duration. In terms of multi-homing here, uh, what we found is that to keep the most loyal workers, the pay per work rate has to be 2.5 to three times the current rate. Um, and for those who kind of switch most of the time, it's about 50% or 100% uh, extra uh, to keep them. So it means that guaranteed pay could work really well um, in terms of retaining the workers um, here. Now, what about the short term, which is happening much more? Well, you may have seen some uh, things like this where companies try to incentivize workers to stay longer with them by offering these what I call consecutive work bonuses. 
right? If you stay three more trips or three more hours, you can get paid uh, the bonus. So actually, I'm gonna show you the more extreme version where you have to stay one hour to get the bonus for that hour. Another type of thing you can do is to impose some sort of frictions or time delay uh, for drivers who are thinking about leaving. So let's say before you can leave, uh, you have to tell us 20 minutes ahead of time. And in those 20, 20 minutes, we may still give you more work. And that's really similar to how Uber actually, you know, give drivers back-to-back -back trips. So you have kind of less time to think about quitting. Uh, um, or some apps, uh, I was told by the driver that to quit, you have to click through about like 20 buttons. So actually that creates some frictions uh, to leave. And so do we see uh, the effect on, on the decisions here? You think about this, right? The, the one on the left here is basically nudge people to work longer by creating less opportunity to quit or to switch out. Uh, but it doesn't depend on anything in the market at all. On the right hand side though, the time delay one, it really depends on the state of the system. If you have a delay when it's busy, very likely the driver will get one more trip. And so they will actually leave even later versus if it's um, low demand period, um, this is gonna wait for this uh, delay and, and until they quit. So the right hand side policy here is more depending on the state. So quickly what we found is that these two policies, um, they reduce utilization, they improve earnings a little bit, and obviously they uh, in, uh, increase the work duration for the drivers. But I think the most important thing and interesting thing we have here is that how about multi-homing decision? Well, as you can see earlier, we about have, we have about 67% of people multi-home at the baseline. When you give people the consecutive bonuses, you can actually significantly reduce the multi-homing likelihood here, which kind of makes sense because you limit the amount of time you can multi-home. Now, when you look at the delay that we think that would increase <clears throat> um, uh, the drivers to stay with uh, the focal firm, we actually found that having a time delay of these frictions actually nudge drivers to leave sooner or to switch out to the competing platform more often. So what does it mean here? Well, as I mentioned earlier, this policy really depends on what is the current state of the system, right? Um, if it's super busy right now, you might want to leave sooner because if you stay with the focal firm, it will be a longer time until you can uh, switch to a competing platform. If it's a low demand period, well, having this delay, it means you're gonna get stuck in the low demand region for 20 more minutes. Uh, so it might nudge you to leave sooner than before. And so what we uh, have here as a takeaway is that it means that depending on the current demand states, um, if it's a peak hours, you could use consecutive work bonuses to try to retain the drivers and uh, decrease the likelihood that they're gonna switch out to the competitor. But when it's a low demand period, when, um, way to actually maybe nudge drivers should take a break, which is a good thing, is to impose this time delay or frictions um, when the drivers choose to leave. And so let me put it all together. Uh, here, we study how geek workers make dynamic decisions about multi-homing. As I mentioned earlier, traditionally, it's been hard to study this because it's really hard to trace and get cross-platform information. So we try to take this first step um, by collaborating with the right hailing company, combining with the public data set and use machine learning based and simulation assisted estimation to try to recover this uh, structural model of how they make decisions. And our prescriptive counterfactuals hopefully provide some useful insights for not just the platforms, uh, but also for the policy makers as well, how to manage this ever growing gig economy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Park. Um, we have one minute for a brief question. Um, and uh, after that, Scott will um, present, uh, will discuss the paper. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Park, I'll ask a very yeah. basic question. Um, if I followed correctly, you know, when you're thinking about uh, multi-homing, you're really thinking about people switching from one passenger, um, you know, carrying application to another one, um, yes, as opposed to, let's say, side. drivers uh, starting to deliver food, right? Mm. Um, is, 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 that, is that a concern? Uh, because you are using a TLC uh, cr crucially for, um, for, the, for the second part, right? Right. Um, so um, for this one, right, it's mostly switching across uh, work of similar types. So again, uh, so it's just all right hailing for now. Um, you may think of food delivery is like a newer uh, options. Uh, I may argue that for New York, uh, 
<clears throat> I didn't live, I never live in New York, but I assume that I think people who deliver food there, they're usually more bikers um, rather than like cars who can take both passengers and food. Um, but again, even though in the future, if we have more data about food delivery, we can definitely include them into, into this. Um, I think, I think what would change is the, the potential of batching orders, for example, um, but the rest would be similar, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think it may be interesting to explore like how results change when you have these um, richer set of um, uh, multi-homing options. The other thing that is um, somewhat related is uh, in the counterfactuals. Um, actually, before counterfactuals, you had this assumption that if you switch from A to B, you do not switch back to A, ah, which yes. was well justified, right? But for counterfactuals, I don't know if this assumption uh, needs to be revisited. Um, ah. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Especially when you think about, you know, paying for time to pay for trip type of stuff. Right, right. That's a really good point. Um, so when we did the, when we uh, made the simulation of uh, if the focal firm actually switched to pay per trip, we allowed them to actually now have uh, different probably of getting a match based on now the pay per trip. Uh, but we do not, we still keep our assumption that they will not switch back to the focal firm, uh, but we could relax that and, and try. Uh, Maybe just an explore this, so that was yeah, no Anyway, super nice talk, super nice, uh, interesting work. Uh, but I think Scott has more interesting stuff to say than I do. So I'll uh, <laughs> turn it over to Scott. Scott, last but not least, do you hear you? Please take it away. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna assume that everyone can hear me. If you can't, someone I assume will speak up and tell me that you can't hear me or see my slides. Um, but first off, thanks uh, so much to the organizers. Thanks to Park for a, a great talk. Uh, I'm excited to, to be a discussant for this excellent paper. Um, so, so what I'm gonna do is, is kind of start by giving you a, a background of where I'm coming from when I read this paper and why uh, you know I'm excited by it. Uh, then I'm gonna, go over what I see as the, the three main contributions, uh, or the th three divisions of contributions of, of this work. And while I do that, I'll introduce a handful of questions. Some are, are very philosophical and abstract. Some are very specific. Um, uh, at, at the end, Park, if you want to choose you know, a couple to share your thoughts on, that would be great. Uh, no pressure to answer uh, everything. Um, OK, but let's dive in without further ado. Um, so just to give you some background on where I'm coming from, so, so I know Park is studying a, a particular focal firm. Uh, I've worked as a, a research science intern at Lyft. I worked with the, the driver positioning team. One uh, incentive that they were in charge of while I was there was this thing called personalized power zones. And so, you know, when I read this paper, the thing that I'm thinking about is that, you know, what do you want to know when you're designing incentives? for gig economy workers. And really what you wanna know is, is how are drivers going to behave in the presence of these incentives? Uh, and so what I, what I think is really exciting about this work is that it, it takes a flashlight and, and shines it on, on this question, basically. It, it gives you a really good way of thinking about how drivers are, are making decisions uh, when presented with uh, uh, different incentives. And so ultimately what these decisions come down to is how much can you make on this platform versus how much can you make elsewhere? And, and what they do in particular that's really nice is really flesh out this, you know, what could I make elsewhere question. And so often in the literature, you know, some very influential papers take a, a, an approach where you just assume some exogenous outside option, which is often uh, potentially just a single value or a simple kind of uh, external uh, you know, given value that maybe is location specific. What happens in this paper is it's, uh, you know, this output that depends on a dynamic, I'm not gonna rehash the math that, that Park showed in this you know, Bellman equation to figure out uh, uh, the different values of, of different decisions. But, but basically, crucially, what this paper does is introduce a third option for workers. So they can continue working uh, for platform A, they can quit, which is this you know, normalized, fixed, roughly speaking, value of an outside option modulo some, some uh, IID noise, uh, or they can switch to this, you know, uh, other firm, and, and the value of that switch is dynamically determined based on a lot of, of, of different things. So this, you know, modeling co uh, contribution, I think, is is a key thing to to highlight. Um, there's a lot of rich heterogeneity in the model. I've highlighted a few ways in which uh, that shows up, but I think it's it's a really nice and, and rich model. Now that comes with some. Uh, 
drawbacks isn't maybe the right word, but, but it comes with some limitations in that, you know, estimating a model that's this complex is really hard. Uh, and so that brings me to, to what I want to highlight uh, as, you know, the second contribution of this paper, you know, putting aside the difficulty of getting the data to estimate something like this, you know, I, I found their, their estimation technique to be really interesting. Uh, I didn't know really anything about this before I read the paper, so it was uh, illuminating for me. Um, it's this adversarial estimation approach using uh, generative adversarial networks. Park explained it quite well. I'm not going to rehash that here, um, but it's essentially an alternative to traditional maximum likelihood, which you can employ when using traditional approaches is, is not something that's practical or feasible given the, the complexity of the model. Um, and it comes with nice asymptotic guarantees. It's not you know, completely um, something that's just based on, we think it will work well in practice. Um, but, but one you know, more philosophical question I had for Park uh, is basically, does the existence of techniques like this, which I, I would expect are going to become more popular in, in coming years, I would expect that I'll see more of this in, in the future. I'm wondering if this influences the types of, of structural models that people create, knowing that you can now make, make things that are more complex and estimate them, or or if we still think of this as maybe like an estimator of last result, in that you know if we uh, you know the gold standard would still be to, to if possible come up with something where where you have a, a less black box uh, approach to the estimation procedure. So uh, you can you can chew on that for a little while. Um, but I wanted to uh, uh, also highlight some of the you know the, the results and and counterfactuals that that I think are are interesting and, and deserve. To be highlighted, I'm I'm going to pick out just a handful that surprised me. Um, there's more in the paper. Park talked about some more. You know, feel free to check out the the paper for those details. Um, but but a couple things that were uh, interesting or or uh, of note to me. One was that drivers seem to underestimate the cost of driving. Um, and anecdotally, this maybe is isn't that surprising. It's something that I feel like I've heard from news articles or or what have you. Um, but I think, you know, having a, an empirical estimation of this, this fact, um, in, in the paper they present, a, like, I think an estimate from AAA about what the actual cost of, of, uh, of driving is, and it's much higher than the mean cost that they derive from their structural model. And I think that's an, an interesting observation that uh, is, is worthy of, of some more attention when you think about regulation uh, going forward. Um, Another thing that was super interesting was drivers being more likely to switch when idle, despite you know, on this focal form that they're looking at, they're getting paid the whole time, regardless of whether they're idle or not. Um, this was particularly surprising to me. I, I didn't have a great uh, explanation. I think there's still some stuff that needs to be unpacked. I thought maybe it might have to do with tips that aren't accounted for potentially, um, but but um, I think I think that's an interesting observation that, that um, a little uh, deserves maybe some more. Uh, some more attention. Um, one thing that Park had a nice graphic on in the in the talk, but that didn't receive quite as much attention in the paper was was the extent to which a driver's location impacts the switching behavior. It, based on the model, it seemed like there might be locations where the focal firm just loses a lot of drivers uh, due to differences in utilization and differences in in wage rates in, in those locations. But I wasn't sure if that was something that came out of of their estimation. Um, so this is more of a specific thing if you want to shed light on. Uh, in terms of the counterfactuals, I was particularly surprised. Uh, you know, a priori, I would have thought that these duration incentives and these departure delays, you know, one of them is imposing a cost. Uh, uh, the other is, is uh, providing some in incentive for sticking around, but those seemed equivalent to me up front. Uh, you know, reading uh, the paper, unpacking it a little bit in terms of these departure delays encourage you to leave earlier, it does make sense that it, that it has this complementary effect, but it's really nice to identify these two levers that seem similar, but that actually can, can be useful in, in, in complementary settings, right? So these duration incentives can be used when you want drivers to stick around for longer. Departure delays could be used to, to try to incentivize drivers to actually leave earlier. Um, and, and so I think that's a nice you know, managerial insight for some of these platforms that I wanted to fly. Um, somewhat related to, to Azan's question about these counterfactuals, just I, I was curious a little bit about their robustness to you know, a variety of potential changes in, in equilibria uh, when you when you run these counterfactuals. So one was utilization rates. Um, I wasn't sure if those were uh, uh, adjusted as a result of, of 
uh, marketplace changes driven by these uh, policy changes. Uh, as on mentioned, the switching behavior. I think I think there is a, a some amount of limitation based on that. But I'd be interested to hear your your thoughts. Um, and then just to conclude my comments, I wanted to mention two uh, broad questions for future work. Again, these are more philosophical. I'm not asking you to write a whole new paper in five minutes. <laughs> but uh, I think there's some interesting work to be done on the interplay between multi-homing behavior and information asymmetry. Um, so you're you know, assuming, and I don't quibble with this, I don't have a, a better suggestion, but you know, drivers in, in your model know exactly the value of their uh, potential future earnings. Um, there's some you know, shocks, so you could think about that as, as noisy signals about their future earnings, but, but in general, the platforms have more information than drivers do about uh, market conditions, potential earnings, and I was wondering if multi-homing in, in some way impacts this informational advantage. Um, and the, the last thing I wanted to say, which is I think you know, something particularly important to the, the way I think about research our community does, is uh, you know, how do we think about these heterogeneous workers? And in your model, they're very heterogeneous. How do we think about managing them in a fair way? Um, right, Because a, a profit maximizing approach is to identify these workers who don't multi-home, who have low perceived driving costs, and just offer them a very low wage. Uh, and, and there's a variety of reasons you shouldn't do that. Uh, some ethical, some potentially legal. I'm not a, a lawyer, so I make no comment on that. But I think there's some really interesting work to be done in that space. You know, People have, have worked a little bit in that area, but I think um, that's one, one question we all need to, to wrestle with. So I'll stop there. I'll, I'll put these questions on, on the screen. If Park wants to answer any of them, I would be uh, thrilled. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Scott. Park, again, the floor is yours yeah. if you want to chime in on any of them. Thanks a lot, Scott, for these great insights. I, I can touch on a few of these. I think uh, the first question, yeah, I think of it more as like a helper for your estimation, right? I feel like the model specification is still based on how we think people behave. Of course, I think if they're, uh, like multiple features in the future or like what some small components that may affect efficiency, I think machine learning can help. But in terms of this particular estimation, I think uh, we pretty set on how people behave based on um, our observation and from the data. And, and so we think of these kind of black box as more like a tool to help speed up the estimation. And I think in the future too, if we ever wanna compare different specifications, I think because we can speed up the estimation, we can use this to help us quickly compare them. Um, Second one, yes, driver locations really, really matters. Um, and I think because of multiple things, one is uh, it's affect how likely you're gonna get a match. It affects the outside option as well. And so one thing that could maybe explain one sub question of this that you asked is like, why would people wanna switch when it's idle, even though they're getting paid? And one explanation I'm, is still not, uh, still need to be verified, but one intuition I have for this is, it's more like a sequences of decisions you have to make. So if you're actually stuck idling in some low demand period, you have less chance to actually get sequence of good work later. Um, so I think one thing I did find a little bit is some people do seem to be specific and strategic in where they start their work so that they can maybe keep on the sequence of VC work and keep getting constant, even though, okay, they're getting paid by the hour, but at least they are gonna be in locations where if they want to switch out, they also have good options as well. Um, but that's a really good point. We should maybe unpack even more about the location effect. And finally, uh, oh yeah, so why do we see these results from the, the bonuses versus delays? And I think as Hannah mentioned, I think it probably depends on that one of them, like the delay, it really depends on the state of the system. Um, the bonuses, it's kind of limit when you can quit, but if it's busy or not busy, it doesn't really affect that decision. But if you are giving them delays and during that time you give them more work, that actually changes the actual time people can quit. And I think that could play a role in why people have an opposite effect here where they want to leave sooner. And yeah, for the other two questions, they sound great. And hopefully that can be our future research. Yay. Sounds <laughs> Thanks, great. Guys. Yeah, happy to talk about it offline. Thanks so much for, yeah, for answering maybe. the questions and for the, the excellent talk and excellent paper. Thank you. Thank you both. Actually, thank you um, all the uh, discussants and the speakers in this uh, in this session. Um, we are officially out of time. So um, at this point, I'm going to conclude the session, but please feel free to hang out in the virtual venue. 
once you close Zoom, uh, you can go back and um, please uh, do not hesitate to ask uh, additional questions to our speakers. Um, thank you for attending the session. Thanks, Mike. Thank you.